uh, Professor Park. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thompson, for inviting me. And uh, today, I think um, I'm going to talk about my music and my practice of doing uh, music technology. And I think um, uh, with this given time of the pandemic, um, we all, all of us as a musician, are going through this drastic change of our musical practice, how we think about music, how we make music, and how you present music. So uh, I want to give you kind of my case of how I have been changing in the uh, past seven months, but also hopefully um, telling you that the core of um, the practice of music technology has not changed. So uh, if you have any questions, and if I'm not answering, just put it on your chat window. I'm going to answer it through the uh, chat window. And I'm also going to um, post some links as we go along with the chat window. So I'm going to share a screen now. And let me actually uh, start by telling you who I am. Um, we usually get asked, OK, so what do you do? Like, uh, I'm like, and you know, because we do so many things, we as a music technologist do so many things, I s have to think. Now I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so. I consider myself as an electronic musician, and that entails that I'm a composer, performer, but also uh, I design instruments. So when I do creative process, when I go through the creative process, all these things are, in, uh, are going together. I perhaps make an instrument uh, that sounds interesting. But also, uh, when I'm making an instrument, I'm thinking about the uh, composition, uh, the music that I'm going to make with it. But also, at the same time, how am I going to present and what kind of things that I can perform. So um, I really like this kind of aspects that the, uh, as a music technologist, I have a lot of control in my creative process. I'm not bound to a certain instrument. I can make one. And things that I can make could be quite uh, unique. Now, talking about unique, uh, I have like a, kind of like a one underlying rule in when I make music. I wanted to make a uniquely electronic sound. I wanted to make something that's only possible through the electronic means. What does that mean? Um, a lot of technology uh, that we are using are kind of like a substitute for the uh, a human for cost all of the time, right? Like, uh, you know, MIDI patch piano is cheaper than a piano, right? Um, having a, a five strings on a uh, logic is, uh, it sounds not better, uh, it sounds perhaps worse, but, you know, it saves our time and energy. But I think there are certain things that you can only do with the electronics, not only in terms of sound, but also in terms of what you can and how you can perform. But ultimately, um, some kind of aesthetics that you can um, only or best express with the electronics. So uh, when I make something, uh, I always think about that. Can I do this with human? Can I actually do this better with the uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps with four people? Then that idea goes away. Can I try, is this the only only way, meaning that uh, can I actually do, do this with, on, with my instrument, with my electronics? If the answer is yes to me, then I keep going. So this is kind of like my way of questioning uh, to me or when I, do pro, uh, when I work on a piece. Is this something that I can only do with, for example, a super collider? Is this something that I can do with the uh, electronic ensemble? Or is this something that I can do only with two people on a drum machine. So uh, uh, I like to try to find that the uniquely um, electronic sound, the very unique thing that you can do with the ensemble of electronic sound. So now I also am a big believer of craftsmanship. Uh, as an electronic musician, we have like hundreds of instruments, literally. You know, we have so many instruments that you can make an instrument, you know, uh, that sometimes we kind of um, bypass uh, getting better at it. 
right? You buy a drum machine and it sounds good. You make a track and then oh, you know what? There's a new model. Let's get it, you know, let's get the new model. Let's do it. So, um, it is easy for us electric musicians to kind of uh, go into the new technology and get, go to the next new technology and you know keep that loop. And I think we lose something in that you know process. Sometimes we may want to kind of like a stop on doing the newest thing but also kind of a go back to the uh, something that you really like and um, kind of dig into it um, and see how much get you can get. So I, I think it's a, it's a uh, mindset of craftsmanship, you know, um, like if you are making a, uh, if you are a craftsman of uh, like uh, you know, ceramics, you spend like 30 years making the ceramics, right? So I think uh, spending some time in developing a certain skill within the big umbrella of music technology is something that I really like to do. And you know, as uh, John mentioned, uh, 100 Strange Sound is one of those ways. I was making 100, um, 100 small pieces that features uh, the combination of the electronics and the everyday objects. So, so uh, it's kind of like, I don't know, I, it's, it's something that I like to do and for long term, uh, it's something that I usually do not get tired of doing. So um, every piece that I make, I kind of think about uh, these, thi uh, these three things. So uh, in the past years, um, let me see if I can do this. Okay, good. I have been uh, trying, uh, I have been uh, specializing in making a s very specific um, format of electronic music and that is uh, electronic music ensemble uh, I have an ensemble, I direct an ensemble at the Wayne State University called Emus. And then, uh, you know, we, I had a very lucky opportunity to work with them for many semesters and, uh, and then, you know, even had some fundings to do travels and you know, make some pieces and, you know, even like get them some gear. And, you know, I've been writing for Electronic Music Ensemble for almost 10 years, but past four years, this was my main goal. So um, here's an example. So here's a PS quartet. I have two that's done. And here uh, I'm going to perhaps play a video. Now, uh, do give me some kind of sign if you do not hear the sound well. Okay, so here's a video of it.
So as the name implies, it's actually a music for the uh, PlayStation controllers. Um, I mapped the uh, super credits to the super, uh, PlayStation controllers, and the uh, a minimum of four people can play. And although it's named quartet right now, you see five people, uh, one doubling a uh, one part. So what they are doing right now is they are looking at the score like this one. Right? And then the score kind of uh, is right now, let's see, right now they are doing solo. He's doing a solo, so here. Right? And then they kind of look at this and if you've been playing a game, you kind of know what this L2 and R2 and this kind of means. So they are basically reading the score and with me, as a me as a conductor. And then they'll probably stop here, like it falls. And now uh, a little bit of um, free improvisation. And now, um, so something about like you know what I what can I do this that I cannot do on a DAW? Perhaps I can improvise, and you will see that I will be improvising my hand gesture, and pr performers will be moving their joystick around me. So every performance is gonna be a little bit different, and uh, every performer can interpret. So every performance that you're gonna see on stage will be different. Here, look at this part. And then I'm gonna give a little decrescendo gesture and because we are human, we are going to slow down when we use the joystick to slow down, it's going to be quicker now when I'm improvising Then a little major seven chord, I think. Like that. Okay. So, oops. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, thank you. I can kind of see the clip. <laughs> So let's go back to what I mean by here, right? So something unique. I think there is a something that we can do as a group of electronic musicians. And that's quite important and it make, it's, it's important to make a distinction between what we can do as a group of uh, human playing electronic music versus me making multiple tracks on a DAW. You still have a lot of instrument, but then I don't want to make a music that's basically like, you know, uh, five tracks in logic played by people right so I want to make something that's like only you can make if a human performer uh, improviser are on uh, PlayStation controller at the same time and playing on the stage so there's a lot of uh, well you know it's, it's uh, there's a specific score but also each performer can improvise can they, they can also interpret the score and the together we always make this some kind of unique version. Even though you listen to this uh, in a in a different occasions, because of our way of interpreting the score, just like the way we interpret the any kind of uh, music, it's going to be different. So, um, and also, uh, you act what the video you just saw was the like uh, performer playing this after like one 
one or two rehearsals, but uh, some performers went with me to the tour and they did like a seven day tour playing this and uh, other music. Then obviously we get better. I mean, any kind of instrument when we play, we get better. And at the, by the uh, middle of the um, tour, everybody memorized the piece. We actually had a com conductor that was not me who memorized the piece and she conducted the piece uh, throughout the uh, uh, second half of the tour too. So. I think learning an instrument and also getting better at it, you know, we enjoy of being able to play the guitar riffs faster, right? So I think we were kind of like, I want to kind of implement that. And especially for the PlayStation pieces, uh, I don't call myself my gamer, but I love games. So we, I have so much of uh, muscle memory that, built, that was built in since I was about like six years old. So. I want to use that, and I know that my all, all of my uh, students actually have this muscle memory, you know, and then they can basically recognize where triangle is without, without even thinking. There you go. You just got it. You, you know, that that there's my triangle, right? So, uh, you know, um, and I think uh, applying that craftsmanship into the music was something that I wanted to do by writing the score that looks like a kind of uh, you know um, command manual for like I don't know Tekken or something like that. Okay, good. Now, I have a question in here, uh, in comments. Is there a limit to how difficult you will make an instrument to play? There is always a limit. Uh, there's, well, you know, let's say, uh, let's think about this. When you are designing an instrument, when we design an electronic instrument, um, possibility is limitless. So, I think uh, when we are creating an instrument and when we are making a music and when we are performing, it's actually a process of elimination. Most uh, and the question, the continuation question is: the most traditional instruments take years to be at all viable. Is that acceptable in your case? Well, let me actually answer that question with the, uh, the presentation of a cobalt bass. So I'm going to hold on the question, but I think um, for PlayStation Quartet, I I was limiting on what I can do with that instruments that I design. And I think all my composition is basically kind of eliminating possibilities. I make an instrument that could do like 100 things, then in the composition, it ends up doing like, you know, five or six. But the instrument itself, uh, the, for example, the PlayStation instruments for PS Quartet, they can do more than that. They can actually play, you know, people playing the PlayStation controller of my piece, they can actually play other pieces using the same algorithm. So there's a, a little bit more larger limit on the instrument, but the piece itself is a um, uh, has l more limits. So I think usually the electronic music pieces that I write is kind of uh, you know maybe really excellent eight eight, eight percent of hundred percent of things that you can do, and that's like you know <laughs> excellent for me, you know, in which I like. Okay, good. So I'm gonna answer the question of do you uh, most traditional instruments take years to be at all viable is that acceptable in your case I'm gonna answer that soon let me actually show you one more thing so now we just had like a five people playing the electronic piece electronic instrument at one point in our ensemble we had like almost 20 people in the ensemble and um, that's a lot of people uh, for electronic musician especially you can actually make one electric musician as loud as entire orchestra, just crank up to 11, right? <laughs> so, so it's, I had a challenge. So this is what I came up with. So I had this piece called Doobie's Toppings. And at one point in your life, you're gonna write a piece about pizza. So this is my pizza piece. And you have a, uh, uh, str it's a, it looks a little more like a kind of a more like a string, uh, more of a um, traditional score, but each note uh, corresponds to a line in your keyboard. And what performers do is this, they will open up the super quieter patch, so I'm gonna open it here, and all they have to do is, oh, is it already open? I think it's already open. Is they just go to the uh, language and evaluate file. Now, let me know if you're actually hearing sound. Good. So, so they have this little freshly blanking line and then 
a little lower sound, higher sound, a little higher than you have a little pitch. Okay. So they're gonna look at the score. Where is my score? Uh, and they will read the score with me with the piano. So it's actually a piano plus the um, computer piece. And someone's gonna be doing piano, and like for example here, they're gonna type ham and cheese, onion, all these toppings, right? So now that we kind of know what's going on, let me gonna actually uh, quit this, and let's watch uh, some of the previous toppings in here. So look, just there's a piano, and it's uh, people with laptops without any amplification. I think 20 people actually at the uh, uh, at the desktop speaker will do. So, here. here. So they're holding A so that you just uh, that kind of get more rhythmic stuff. Okay. So again, what is, what can I do that I cannot do in any other format? So uh, this is a recording, but in a, in a real performance, when you're watching this on a stage, I would locate the performers throughout the audience or like a kind of make a kind of big circle. Because now if you think about it, now I have a 20 channel multi channel system. Right? And then they can actually be in all of the place. So now, as long as you are okay with the small volume that's that's coming out from the uh, laptops, then I have really, really large multi-channel audio and the visuals. It's a basically 20-channel audio and the uh, video that I can place in, uh, and I, then I can adapt in any kind of uh, 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 la any kind of hall. And then every experience that you're gonna get when you're watching it will be different. Because right now they are improvising by writing some toppings on a pizza, but uh, I do not give any kind of specific um, you know, tempo. They they have improvisation, so this section again will be quite different. Yeah, uh, quite different. Good. I have a little question there. I'm gonna answer as we go along. Okay, so.
So I'm gonna skip to uh, to the end. So now I'm kind of like uh, slowly uh, introducing the uh, uh, pitch. Oh, did I crash it? Oh no way! Oh, there you go. I think my computer's kind of like a little. Let me quit Super Collider so that it gives a little bit more of a. So hold the A, and you can see that there's an A kind of popping up right here. If they play the right, oh, there you go. A, A, A. So you have a constant rhythm now. Okay. okay. So now. John asks, is this unrecordable music? Excellent segue. So here is the, my kind of uh, uh, philosophy. So uh, as a performer, we value interaction and actually presenting something to the audience on stage, right? And we, me, me as a performer, uh, I believe that there's something that's just like super unique when I present a music here and now as a person to person. When I'm on a stage and I present music and I improvise with my instruments and and that is something that is going to be unique. And also for ex and, and objectively if you are recording uh dubious topping with a stereo mic on a live uh, on a hall it's going to be a reduction. It's going to be a compromise of what you actually can hear as an audience at that time. You are going to lose all this multi-channel system, uh, multi-channel sounds and all these, you know, lightings and everything that you can see as a human, right? So I think there are certain things that uh, despite all our technology to make a good recording, there are certain aspects of music that I don't think we can record yet you know, in a, in a most perfect way. And although electronic music is based on, a lot of electronic music here is based on recording technology, I think we can make a music that has, an, uh, 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 that has some unrecordable features. There's a music that I think um, that has this core value that's just simply not recordable and you have to be here and you have to be here and now on with me on the live stage to actually get the sound. And as a musician, I think we have that kind of experience within any um, um, concert that, that, you know, I have a vivid memory of my concert, my favorite concert, actually being me on a, like a certain seat and actually listening to this person. And I just cannot find that feeling in the uh, recording of that same exact same concert. So. This is like my, my kind of high goal. Like, if I make and present my music, can I actually achieve a sound that is unrecordable and that sounds the best when I'm listening to it on the, you know, on stage, right? That's kind of like a, my kind of uh, um, you know extension of this idea of uniquely electronic music. Mm. So, good. Now uh, I have a question in here. Is this is the sound coming directly from the laptop or is uh is there any form of audio routing and amplification? It's actually the sound coming out from the um, uh, directly from the laptop speaker. There's no routing between each other. Uh, one thing that I strive for, you know, music for this kind of a large ensemble is technically it has to be easy to set up. If somebody wants to play my piece, they don't have to know anything about the super quieter, and all they have to do is like three clicks and they're ready to go. That's kind of like my kind of technical goal. So. So then I have to kind of make a little bit of trade-off. Uh, networking will increase the risk of something going wrong, so uh, I take it out. So uh, to answer your question, yeah, it's very simple of simple routing of when you press a key, sound comes out from the speaker. Now, next question. Uh, 
could this concert be em emulated in a virtual reality environment? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't tried. Uh, you know, I think we all know about this. Like uh, this, uh, we are we are seeing the limits of how much you can do as an ensemble in a virtual environment. So. I actually don't know the question. I don't, once, once again, you know, I'm actually gonna go to, you know, I'm actually gonna t touch on that question very soon. What about now? Like, can I actually play these dubious toppings now in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic? So that's what I'm gonna actually talk about in five minutes. But now I, I'm actually gonna go back to this question of, so how much time you wanna spend in the instrument? Well, let me show you. So here's a, my solo, solo piece that I do. And this one actually does not involve any, like, uh, you know, me, there's no instrument design. Uh, it's actually just uses the uh, plain, simple, um, called Volca Beats, okay? And I thought about it, you know, it's a very fun instrument. Um, I guess everybody hates the Volca Beats uh, snare sound, but I kind of like it. Let me see what I can do if I play this like uh, for about a year, right? So let me see if I practice this enough. Can I make something that's unique? Now, in this case, right, it's very uniquely electronic. And if I want to make it uniquely electronic, I do not want the vocal beat sounds like a uh, substitute drummer. I don't want to sound like a, like a, what's that guy, uh, the Carl in Garage Band, you know, uh, drummer. I don't know what's his name, right? Yeah, so. What can I do in a drum machine that the um, uh, good drummer cannot do? That was kind of my, my, my main goal. So here's my kind of answer after playing it for about a year. Okay, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit.
So on stage, when I want to, when I perform this on stage, I will use like a webcam to, you know, shoot my like uh, 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 like like this, and then we'll um, it's going to be projected on the bigger screen on the live stage. So uh, it's just such a small instrument. I actually use the technology to enlarge the visuals. So for this kind of performance, I will actually um, use the webcam to project it on on the stage there. Right. Skip to the end. Ending is always important. And with the delay, yes. Right. Good. So, I don't know, like, uh, how much time do you have to spend for an instrument? Well, not so sure, but at least for me, um, practicing this uh, for like a year, I feel like I'm at the stage where if this were guitar, I can play a scale without looking at my hand. Right? We, I can actually kind of play this perhaps a little bit, you know, eyes closed, but then that's not it. So uh, I hope that I can get more out of this thing, but um, um, this is something, you know, I think I practice this quite a bit because I found some unique features that I just cannot do with the human drummer. And that's what I kind of like uh, ma made me interested in actually find, uh, using it for uh, extensive amount of time. Now, all the examples that you are seeing is actually in my uh, YouTube channel. So um, uh, there's a little bit more than that. But then I think this is kind of like summarizes what I usually do to create a, a uniquely electronic and unrecordable um, music that's best, that sounds best when you are on, when I'm on the stage and when you are in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, live hall with me. Okay. Now, do you have any other questions before we go to our present time? Okay. What does virtuosity mean to you in the context of your performance? Does physical virtuosity play a secondary role to mental virtuosity, thinking about cobalt bass? Ah, good question. Um, I think as a music technologist, we have a little dilemma because if we can make, if we increase our uh, mental virtuosity, if we actually make, have a, like amazing chop to make a max or you know, a super credit patch, it looks very simple on the surface, right? This is an amazing gear that you have on your pocket, but you have one button, right? So something that I spent like a month to make a patch, then for the uh, audience or performer, you see like two buttons, right? So there's this dilemma of making something really awesome in the software, but then it kind of uh, be perceived as, uh, oh, that's just two buttons, right? On the other hand, Right? When we are making a kind of a physical virtuosity, we see a lot of like a flashy things. And then, um, then you know, we, we, if it looks like I'm doing something like, you know, virtuosity. So, but at, at the same time, I don't know, it's, it's a, I think both are important, but also it's an interesting, you know, in a, in a tech, in the music technology field, it's a kind of difficult thing to balance, like uh, how much, you want to show and how much you want to kind of internalize. Um, so I think um, I actually value quite a bit about the uh, visual virtuosity as, as long as it's, it, it is not a uh, showing off. For example, not offending anybody, but if you make a same sound by pressing a space bar like this or like, like this, I don't know. Right, so uh, when we are, uh, so uh, um, when I like to be kind of a more virtuosity on stage, then I want to actually have a reason and meaning of me doing these things, right? So um, hopefully in the video that you may see in my other performances, um, if you see me doing something like kind of like, you know, doing like this, you know, performer thing, you know, then I, I hope it, I can, you know, I did that not because to show, you know what, I'm actually doing something, you know, important, but it came out because 
it, 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 the, the sound and the performance practice actually made me to do that. Okay, so I don't know, to answer your question, I think uh, th those are equally important, but also just keep in mind that, you know, we have this, you know, built-in disadvantage of making very complicated, you know, software like simple, but that's, that comes with our job. So, <laughs> but, you know, that, you know, at the same time, because if, if your software is a simple, if your software instrument is uh, simple, then you have many more people who are willing to use your software. So I think uh, in terms of the um, preserving and making uh, repeated performances, uh, I at least try to make software, at, at least the interface part, uh, as simple as possible. Okay. Thank you. So I love performing. I love performing uh, on stage. And then COVID-19 happens. Right? All my performance gets canceled. You know, I cannot basically do this thing here in Naunus. And then, you know, we get we go into this depression of what the am I gonna do, right? And when you go there, then you try to find some answer. So, you know, we as a musician, we have been doing a lot of like a live streaming and a performance um, using the, uh, you know, uh, Zoom or Facebook, right? We all did that. But then I have a little of uh, unsatisfaction of doing it. For me, ah, uh, I guess I need to go get over this feeling. But when we are performing on stage uh, for the video camera, it is a compromise of what I can do. And and um, you know, as, as as I said, like I can do so much more. You can get so much more. I can give you so much more if you're you know in front of me. But for now, for the uh, foreseeable time, when I perform live on the video. Uh, on, on like this, it's going to be a compromise. So I kind of try to think of like, this, okay, what can I do that is ele uniquely electronic, but also not having a compromise, but also not as a fixed media. So let's think about it. So if you actually do not, if I don't want to have um, any kind of a compromise in presenting my music, the best way would be I will make a uh, pre-recorded track and send you uh, like a Wave or AIF, and then if you listen to it in your home, I'm not losing any audio quality, and you are basically hearing what I'm hearing. So I guess there's a way, right? If you actually send the fixed media into the audience directly, then if the audience listens to that uh, on their home with their own system, then I'm not losing any quality. But can I actually kind of do a similar thing, but without using the fixed media? Well, my answer, so that was uh, doing this series called the uh, Computer Music Practice Examples. So let me just go there now. Okay. And it is a, a mix of a couple of things. Oh, I'm here already. Okay, I don't need to go here. All right. So every entry of the Computer Music Practice comes with a um, some kind of a tutorial of how I design an instrument like this. So if I go like uh, Google uh, Drive, then it comes with a tutorial of an instrument, how you design an instrument using a diagram. So it actually has a kind of like a educational uh, elements. But also, it comes with a uh, working super quiet code, but also a standalone app. So if you're not a uh, super quiet user, you can still use the a standalone app in a Mac or just run the code in the uh, PC. And then it also comes with the video of me showing the instrument. Hello, so welcome. it's basically it's a, uh, I'm, I'm giving you an app. And I'm giving you a little app or like a, a, a little audio processor that does a very specific thing. And the process that I'm giving you is not like a if you know EQ or reverb, but a compositional tool. So when you are using this tool, uh, you are basically making the music the way I did, and the sound quality, of course, is good because you are creating a music from your computer, and you are making the music that is not uh, in, in terms of quality not streamed. So let me give you an example of that. So uh, in the here is a patch that. I'm going to show you. This is the la latest version of it. So 
when you run this one, you're going to get uh, this kind of thing. And for example, here is a, um, uh, an app called uh, SIOE. And it, give, it makes a kind of a supercut audio. So let's actually uh, try to get the, uh, some songs that we know. Um, let's see, samples. So it basically creates uh, what I think like a, is a kind of like a audio equivalent of a supercut. Like you have seen supercut videos, right? Like you know, all these somebody like you know walking on a street, hundred of them put together, like a twelve two hour long movie supercut into ten seconds. So can I do kind of an equivalent thing? Well, let me try to kind of convince you with the sound itself. So here's the uh, Earth, Wind, Fire, September. Right. I'm not going to play an entire thing. We all know this song, right? So now we're going to just um, drag that into here. And I'm going to make about uh, 20 repeats going up and down. And each hit will be about 2 seconds. And I'm going to repeat at the tempo of like uh, 200. Then we're going to play it. And it's going to sound something like this. And it makes a kind of like a symmetric form of getting into the 20 samples playing at once and then go back here. It's a very symmetrical form this way. Now, I have like, like a short version. Basically, play the peak of that. So one sound kind of is a compromise of a lot of parts from the song. And if I do it right, I sometimes hear the entire song in like, in, in like in three seconds. Maybe then, you know, with that kind of mind, then I can kind of uh, make a little like super cut of uh, any sound. I don't know. Let's do the uh, BZS Carmen. We make this and a four. Maybe this, I'm going to make a little, little less texture and say. Oh, you get this kind of like a, like a you know, <laughs> four second snippet of the entire piece. Like, a, I don't know. I know it's a kind of conceptual thing, but it's a. I kind of like it. So, there's a tool. See, this is, for me, this is something that I kind of thought about. This kind of an interesting you know, way of perhaps cutting and pasting the audio. But then, you, as a user, can use your own sound to make your own. So, the, uh, hopefully, this is very uniquely electronic, and this is, does not have any kind of a compromise if you use this on your home. You make your own music, and then, uh, uh, I saw the comment I just got started. So, so but, but I think you can actually make your own music using this tool, but also uh, you are picking uh, my brain. You're, you're actually kind of looking into like, you know, what, what, is, what is this guy thinking in terms of uh, composer and the uh, sound uh, and the instrument designer. So hopefully by using these kind of uh, examples and then, and then also looking at the, um, uh, you know, ins and outs, uh, I think uh, I, I, I think I want to, I'm trying to achieve this uniquely electronic experience. And also, this part is quite important for me uh, because uh, computer music practice examples, I started it because, let me actually, see, instead of me um, stumbling, so I started this because I f think there's a little gap between our education. Like when we are going into the class, we learn a lot about a certain tool. Like there's a semester, we can learn about SuperCredit. There's a semester, we can learn about Max and more. And then I have to figure out how to use those tools to create a music that I like. And that part, right, so from the tools to music, that from tools to music, there's this, like, this space where I need to figure out and um, there's no 
like kind of like, uh, for me at least I actually I had to figure myself. So in my uh, um, attempt, this is my attempt of actually filling that gap. Now you know the tools. How am I going to use this tool to create a music that I like? And the best way for me to teach that is to show my example of I have this tool and I want to make this music. How am I doing it? So I'm going to, uh, in, in CMP project, I give lots of details on how I use SuperQuieter to create uh, uh, the music that I like. And therefore, I needed a lot of... Uh, diagrams and explanations. So it's more of a kind of a way, my way of teaching a uh, composition, electronic music composition for people who are looking into the way of using the tools that they just learned and how to actually kind of use that. Okay. Now, incoming YouTube copyright strike, the comments. Wow. Let's see if the algorithm actually makes the, uh, <laughs> recognizes my super cut. <laughs> It'll be I don't know. I'll let you know if I get some uh, warning. They actually warn me to, um, when I play my own music, they actually give me like a little copyright warning. You're playing uh, music of this guy. I'm like, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. I mean, if they recognize it, impressive. Okay, very good. So, let me, uh, so there's a couple of uh, more tools in here that which I won't be able to show, but there's also a sh um, tool that you can actually create your I create like an audio palindrome. If you use an APG, then you will be able to create a sound that sounds exactly the same when you play it forward and when you play it backward. And it's, uh, you know, if even you use a reverse function on the um, DAW, you're going to see that it sounds quite the same. So, uh, here, you know what? I'm going to do it. So, here's a beatbox sound that I'm going to put. And the sound too will be a little chicken. Okay. And I can kind of hear the rocks ch chuckling somewhere. And then here, um, somebody saying, Oh, yeah. Right. So let's put that in. And then I'm going to have um, some repetition of each <laughs> part. And then we're going to record it. Oh yeah. Hi y'all. Oh yeah. Hi y'all. Oh yeah. Hi y'all. Oh yeah. Hi y'all. So you recorded the sound. Is this the one? Oh yeah. So, now we're going to put this on audacity. Don't crash. Oh, no. The beach ball. Ah, there you go. And you can visually see that the first half and the second half are oh, yeah. Hi, exactly yeah. the same. And I can reverse it. Oops, I, I have a, I can reverse it. And it looks the same. So I have a audio palindrome oh, yeah. that, that Hi, you can create oh, with uh, any yeah. kind of TV samples in here. Hi, uh, oh yeah. Good. So in this uh, uh, CMP examples, I've been kind of focusing on again what's uniquely electronic. But what are the things that I was not able to do in the live performance? I think there's a something that I can do with electronics in this kind of format that I cannot do in the live. For example, I can actually focus on the form and the structure of the music that, uh, that you can only do when you start to use the audio sample and when you're actually are making a recording. A formal structure that's only possible in electronic kind of intrigues me. Like that kind of audio palindrome which sounds exactly the same when you you know, make it like a forward and backward. Uh, it's maybe it's possible with the uh, uh, acoustic ensemble, but in terms of the you know perfect palindrome, in terms of like a timbre, I think electronics is the best medium. And the um, this kind of a long form supercut, you kind of uh, 
you know, it takes about three seconds to make that kind of an interesting supercut and then kind of a triangular um, uh, uh, form. So I think there's a certain kind of a form in music that uh, you can do best with electronics. And the best way to prove that as the part of the uh, computer music practice example is make music. So along with the, all these apps and the uh, sliders, I have Bandcamp site where you can listen to the music that I made with the, uh, the, uh, the apps that you just saw. So here is a uh, last piece that I used with the um, uh, I used the uh, SIOE the supercut one So it's basically an SIOE uh, making a, uh, it's doing its thing with the original song on the track two. But you don't have to know my original sound. I hope that it has its own um, um, things to listen for. And it's gonna go into the peak around here. And then it's gonna go back. Here is a uh, audio palindrome. Something like that. So, whole part of the CMP project, the computer music practice examples, um, is to give the tool for the uh, users to play and create, but also for me it was important to show that it is something that you can make music. This is something that I use to create a, something that's kind of a, I don't know, make it uniquely like, you know, my sound but also something that you can do uh, well with the electronics.
Okay, I think we are getting close to the uh, time. How am, I, how am I doing with the time? Ta yeah. Are you okay? Uh, uh, yeah, you're doing really well. We run an hour to an hour and a half, so it looks like we're right on track. Mm. But we would love to hear more. Okay, excellent. So, uh, well, no, we don't know when the um, when when, when our uh, uh, COVID-19 situation will end. But I have some hopes. So when that comes, actually, you know what? Not, you know, I shouldn't I shouldn't write this as a post-pandemic. Yeah. So my future projects. Uh, I have uh, one installation that's um, coming that I need to finish. Uh, but you know, in lieu of the CMPE, I'm preparing for the uh, another set of uh, CMP projects. Uh, if the first half, first season, was kind of a more of a tools that uses your own audio, now um, I'm thinking about. Actually, I, I have it already. I, I have a pieces that's. Uh, based on synthesis, like uh, making the waveforms and you know uh, using some algorithms to create a synthesizer. Okay, so that's coming in, and the uh, so here is the one of the examples that I got a grant to grant to produce, and it uses the electromagnetic pickup, and then um, here there I say, do you guys know no input mixer? Yeah, there I say I'm actually making no output mixer this time. There's no output from the mixer, but you can you gonna hear it. So, um, I'm I'm uh, <laughs> it has something to do with uh, you know using a magnet and electromagnetic field, but I think uh, it's gonna be a kind of a uh, interesting thing. So uh, I'm gonna start posting the video of this and the uh, progress perhaps in two weeks, but. Um, this is something that I'm kind of excited about. Once again, very uniquely electronic, and then electromagnetic, actually. And then um, I think uh, it's going to be premiering around Halloween. So we're going to have lots of uh, kind of a, you know, our eerie classic electronic sounds in there. OK. Do you have any questions, guys? Well, thank you very much. Um, that was a great talk. Uh, very interesting to hear. Uh, we have performed one of your works here. I'm not sure if any of the current contingent was part of it, uh, but I, I can't remember. It was like an etude for ensemble. Can't, it seemed like that. So um, yeah, it's uh, on, off, and fade. I think. Yeah, that's right. Yes, and and uh, what was interesting about that is how challenging it actually was to perform. So even though it seems simple, it's it's pretty challenging to do well. Um, so I just wanted to relate that we had a good time performing that piece, I guess. It looks like there's a larger question in the chat, so I'll just duck out for a second. Yeah, so thank you for uh, playing the one of for fate. Uh, once again, um, I'm just gonna type in the name. And uh, every piece that you heard today, and every piece that, that's, uh, uh, that I kind of made in the past, 10 years, they are all available online, and all the super credit patch and all the technology, software-wise, you need is actually uh, all free and online. So feel free to check it out. Now I have a question coming up, and here I'm gonna read it. One area of opportunity that faces an educator is addressing the need of a diverse cross-section of learners. This includes exceptional students. They may have physical or mental disabilities, and Western musical instruments, and even those of other traditions, can prove to be challenging to some individuals. Would you, as a composer and a teacher, care to comment on the adaptability and the flexibility of electronic music and instruments for addressing the need of a diverse range of learners and performers? I'd love to. Well, you know, the whole piece about the PlayStation controller, um, I was hoping that if you are a gamer, if you play games, this could be a kind of like a little nice entrance point for you to play electronic music with what you know. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really all about um, using the uh, instrument, in electronic instrument that's readily available, like a keyboard, right? like, a, you know, like a typing keyboard or like a, 
game, uh, like you know, game controller. So PS Quartet, by the way, if you if you feel like you know, 50 bucks is quite a bit for the game uh, controller, then you know, I you can actually plug in like 15 bucks Logitech controller, and you can still play. You can actually use the Xbox controller too. So my um, practical uh, philosophy in making electronic music perform uh, instrument is that it should be affordable but also it should be transferable meaning that you can play this without me helping to set up so uh, I think a lot about this like easiness of getting into it and then use that as a kind of a bridge to kind of make more interesting and uh, um, different music uh, more more intriguing music but uh, I think as an electronic musician we have a uh, we have Okay, I think we have uh, this power to engage um, today's listeners and today's uh, diverse uh, musicians and you know populations. I mean, if you think about it, everybody has an instrument, and that's in your phone, that's in your computer. My five-year-old kids, six-year-old kids, they learn to play music using like uh, what is that Google's. Uh, the the Google's or Sound Lab, you know, there's like this like little drum machine you can go, right? So, uh, you know, if you and I need this, I all I need is like you know a uh, click, right? Then perhaps, but that could be the very first instruments that makes somebody to go, hey, you know what? I want to actually figure this out. You know, I want to actually do more. So I think as an electric musician, we have power and the responsibility these days to keep the music going and, and 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 also it's very accessible and also international too um, and you know something that I make now could be used in you know Korea like like five minutes after and we have and they gonna make a kind of basically the same music with the same tool so I think we have a lot of uh, you know power but also comes with the responsibility and responsibility in the most practical sense that the uh, it, it should work regardless of me being there you know I, I cannot be there every time you know um, something goes wrong so we want to take extra time to create an instrument that's you know as bulletproof as possible but also easy to use you know I mean it's very you know very personal opinion of me but I think uh, we uh, have you know as you mentioned I think we have uh, tools and we have a means and we it's, it's uh, actually a uh, something that we have to do we have to always think about like you know how can I reach this with the um, uh, people with the uh, disadvantage people who may not have um, access to the uh, traditional music education and that's something I think we always have to think about it you know um, and then um, I hope I answered your question I think I can just go on about this <laughs> you know in fact John and I were talking about this before you know we started the uh, lecture too now, yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's something that you know we 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 always think about, and um, it's something I think it's it's. I think I'm losing a word. I I, I know that there's like one thing that I really want to say, <laughs> but I cannot find the correct way of saying it or like. We are multimedia person, you know, by design. You know, when you are doing electronic music or music technology, we are not just a musician. Uh, we are not just a, uh, you know, engineer, but we are multimedia. And I think we are also have uh, some kind of a nice, you know, um, opportunity to combine uh, music and something else, right? And uh, music and education, music and you name it and that's also again a power and the responsibility and responsibility meaning we actually have I have at least for myself I think I have a responsibility to do do it well uh, at this point of my career I um, I'm gonna think really hard to actually make when I make a presentation it's going to be uh, something that not only the musicians will like it, but also uh, whoever actually are not know much about the music technology um, kind of gets interested in what I'm doing and actually gets some part of the what I'm doing. So 
Um, hopefully that's kind of like a recurring goal uh, theme that you may have seen my music and the way I present it. Um, practicality, you know, <laughs> yeah, there you go, that, that's it, practicality. Computer music practice example, right? There's this kind of this practicality that we have to think about as a music technologist. Okay, that's uh, some another responsibility and the things that we need to think about in addition to making a good music. And I think we have a meeting point where you don't have to compromise practicality over musicality and uh, vice versa. And that's the goal that I really want to find in, you know, in, in the rest of my career. Can I make a practical music but also super interesting and not actually kind of sacrificing one another? I don't know why I want to say that, but that's what I should. That that was basically what was, what was in my mind. Okay, tell us about the music technology program at Wayne State. So Wayne State University is located in the um, Detroit, Michigan. It's a state university, and the uh, Wayne State University's music technology program is undergraduate only. And um, uh, and I've been working there for uh, past four years, and now this is my fifth year. It is a, uh, I love it because we are right in the city and, um, you know, as you uh, realize that, the, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, certain university has a certain functions and I think Wayne State actually has a, this kind of um, role and a function of providing the uh, music technology and uh, music to the city of Detroit. So, uh, I mean, it's a, again, it's, a, it's a something, you know, sometimes I feel daunting and overwhelmed, but I also think that I'm lucky to actually work in here to provide hopefully something positive to the community, uh, the music, music community of Detroit and beyond. Okay. Good. Right. Yeah, but it's undergraduate only program, so uh, if you're thinking about the graduate programs, um, uh, Dr. Thompson will know much <laughs> more about that. <laughs> with this. Okay, and I think that's it. Right? Great, that's thank you very much. Uh, this is a wonderful talk. We really appreciate um, your time and uh, the really wonderful music that you shared with us. And we look forward to checking out more on our own. And uh, we'll be in touch with you. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to end our stream here, our, our inaugural or our initial, uh, our initial um, lecture series, it turns out. It's starting to thunder here, so it looks like we picked a good time to not lose power. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, and we'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>